Good evening. Welcome to this Good Friday service as we conclude Holy Week in preparation for what is to come. My name is Dalton Rushing. I'm one of the pastors here. Whether you're worshiping in person or whether you're worshiping online, know that you're welcomed by the God who welcomes all of us. It is good to be together on this day. In this service, we'll sing, we'll pray, we'll hear words from Scripture. You will hear brief uh, passages of Scripture read that represent the seven last words of Jesus. And at, after each of these brief passages of Scripture, you'll hear some kind of reflection, a choral reflection or a spoken uh, meditation. Our prayer is that this is a meaningful service for you on this Good Friday. Friends, as you are able, I invite you to stand for our call to worship. Let us remember how the sky went dark. Let us remember how his mother was there. Let us remember how people mocked him. Let us remember how his friends fled. Let us remember how in the midst of all that, Jesus still chose love. Let us worship holy God. Our opening hymn is number 288 in the United Methodist Hymnal, were you there? Let's sing together.
you may be seated. Please pray with me. God who asked for a drink, God who was killed by the state, God who offered love and grace even from the cross, we are at a loss for words. What do we do with this day? The air is heavy, our hearts are heavy. The suffering of this world feels particularly close, spilling out all over us. And yet, even in this space, we know you are moving. Even in this space, we know that this is not the end. Give us the heart to hear this story and the courage to let it change us. Gratefully, we pray. Amen. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Good Friday belongs to confession. For on this day, we hold up to the light everything that is going wrong in the present day. So we breathe deeply. We bow our heads. We speak the truth out loud about who we long to be. And we trust that God is already reaching out for us as we speak. Knowing that, let us pray together. God of unfathomable mercy, if we were there, we'd like to think that we would have defended you. We'd like to think that we would have stopped the guards and silenced the mockery, protected your body, and defended your name. However, if we're honest with ourselves, we probably would have been at the edge of the crowd, silent and afraid. How often are we silent and afraid? How often do we wait for the stones to cry out for us? Forgive us. Please forgive us. Amen. Even from his place on the cross, even while being met with cruelty and violence, Jesus overflows with truth and grace. He sees those around him. He speaks connection and belonging into existence. He offers forgiveness. Friends, if this is true from the cross, it is certainly true here. We are surrounded by grace. We are held in love. We are forgiven over and over again. The true never changes. Thanks be to God. Amen. Truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise.
Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. Jesus died the same way that he lived. He lived with compassion, authenticity, and grace. He died that way too. He lived deeply connected to others. He died that way too. He lived creating families out of strangers, bringing all kinds of people together in all kinds of places, in boats and in synagogues, on the seashore, up a tree, and in a parade. At the town watering hole, in the middle of the day, and around tables in the evening. On a holy night in a stable with stars shining above. And at the foot of the cross when the sky turned dark and everything seemed to fall apart. Jesus creates families. I don't really understand what people mean when they talk about biblical family values. As far as I can tell, Jesus only had one family value. Everyone should have family. The families that Jesus brought together were weird. And I can't quote him on this, but he seemed to like them that way. The weirder, the better. Fishermen and unmarried women. Zealots and doubters. Religious snobs and unruly children. Tax collectors and people who were possessed by demons just yesterday. You and me. Jesus brings us all together. Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. So much about Jesus' death is unexpected and surprising but not this. Jesus died the same way that he lived and the same way he calls each of us to live. Jesus creates families. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? On the afternoon of June 10th, 2016, I got a phone call from Ashley, my dear friend and our children's godmother. It had been almost four years since I had received a phone call like this one. Ashley's voice shook as she shared that our mutual friend Becky had put her six-month-old Grace to sleep at 10 a.m. that morning for her usual nap, and she never woke up. 
Grace had died of SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome, with no explainable cause. After my initial shock, the overwhelming emotion I felt was deep and unrelenting rage. It lay thick in my throat like a scream unable to burst forth. My jaw ached, clenched shut with words that I could not say. Tears lived so close to my surface that they would burst forth without warning. I wanted to scream, I wanted answers, I wanted to be numb. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A few days later, Ashley and I flew to Chicago together for Grace's wake and funeral mass. There was a rhythm of our time together on that flight. We would speak, we would cry, and we would sit in silence. We would speak, we would cry, and we would sit in silence. We talked plainly about our experiences of grief. Not four years had gone by since Ashley's husband, Jeffrey, had died unexpectedly at the age of 26. They had been just a week shy of their first wedding anniversary. How could this happen again, we questioned. We were flying to a reunion of friends. We had stood together at one another's weddings, and we would now stand together again for a second time as we buried another precious loved one. We named the anger we felt. I shared that after Jeff's death, anger exploded from me in weird and random ways. But in Grace's death, I was furious with God and God alone. The death of this innocent baby girl, a baby I had loved and celebrated since the announcement that she, Grace Margaret Baker, was to be. It shook me to my core. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? How could this happen? Why would this happen to my friends who are amazing parents? How could this happen to our friend group again? And why in the world does sudden infant death syndrome exist? Life is so very fragile, often unfair, random, brutal, unexplainable. And people and places far and wide know deep and devastating tragedy. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22 begins as a lament, questioning God. Why have you forsaken me? I cry out and you don't answer. Yet it ends in praise. The author writes, I will praise, revere, honor the Lord, because he doesn't despise or detest the suffering of the one who suffered. He didn't hide his face from me. No, he listened when I cried out to help for him. Future generations will hear, God is faithful. God has saved us. Rabbis in, Je rabbis in Jesus' time committed to knowing the entire Hebrew, Hebrew Bible. So there is no doubt that Jesus knew this psalm in its entirety. In his despair and deep sorrow, Jesus could only verbalize the beginning lament. And sometimes that's all we've got. And that's okay. It does not take away from God's faithfulness. In our rage and pain, God is present. God is listening. God does not despise those who suffer. God is faithful. God has saved us. Jesus gives us permission to shout, 
my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There may be a moment, a month, a season when you can't believe or say the rest of the psalm. And that's okay. God is present. God is listening. God does not despise those who suffer. God is faithful. God has saved us. Thanks be to God. Amen. I thirst. As Jesus hung on the cross, a fully human person in excruciating pain, he asked for a drink. It's hard sometimes for us to remember that Jesus, God incarnate, also experienced these basic human instincts. He needed sleep. He needed food. He needed water. The physical pain of the crucifixion can hardly be imagined by us today. And that pain that he felt was compounded by the emotional and spiritual pain he was undoubtedly in. Betrayed by his friends, unsure if his mission was complete, lonely, hurt, angry, and thirsty not only for an actual drink, but for so much more. We know this thirst. We know how it feels when the sun is beating down on us, our mouths are dry, and all we can think about is a sip of water. But even more than that, we know what it feels like to long for something in our bones to need something so badly that it feels like a physical craving. And just like water, the things that we thirst for are essential to life itself. Forgiveness, fulfilling relationships, healing, justice, peace. While we may not know the physical pain of the crucifixion, we do know how it feels to long for something, to need that drink of water to soothe our all-consuming thirst. And all too often, we look for other ways to quench this thirst, sometimes self-medicating with alcohol or food, sometimes throwing ourselves so hard into our careers that nothing else matters sometimes focusing so much on our children or our parents or our partners that we drown out our own deepest cries. Even Jesus, God incarnate, felt thirsty. This thirst connects us to him in both a simple and a profound way. Our thirst is quenched by the one who asked for a drink in his darkest moment and stands with us in ours. He knows our needs, he knows our pain, and suffers along with us. And through it all, Jesus, this living water, restores, refreshes, and renews us. It is finished.
Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. It strikes me that many of the most important moments in life involve the Bible and the vow. The incoming president of the United States stands in front of the nation every four years across from the Chief Justice of the United States and puts a hand on the Bible of all things, a Bible, and repeats the oath as written in the Constitution, I do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. It isn't just grand public events, of course. When a person is baptized into the Christian faith, the pastor quotes those words from Jesus, the words of the Great Commission, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And in our United Methodist tradition, we vow, we vow to receive Jesus as our Savior, to put our whole trust in his grace. Then there are weddings, of course. There are always vows at a wedding. I don't know if you got married in a church or by a pastor or if you've ever been married at all, but we did, Stacy and I, all those things actually. We got married in Cannon Chapel at Emory University, that strange, lovely chapel that was constructed in the brutalist style with concrete and exposed wood, and we stood there in that space in front of those exposed beams in front of God and everybody as the pastor preached from the Bible and then asked us to repeat the same vows that millions of people have spoken. I, Dalton, take you, Stacy, to be my wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish until we are parted by death. This is my solemn vow. Each of these institutions, the country, the church, the institution of marriage, each of these institutions is bigger than any one person or any two people. It's bigger than all of us, bigger than the sum of its parts. That's the idea behind these institutions. And each of us participates in the life of these institutions to some extent for this reason. For each of us feels a call, a longing, a desire to be part of something that is bigger than ourselves. Each of us feels that tug to something greater. We yearn for what the theologian Friedrich Schleiermacher calls a sense and a taste for the infinite. Christians call that infinite thing God. And in this, his last word, Jesus calls toward that infinite thing, just as we do, though we fall short so often. Jesus calls out, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. It is a resignation, but it is not a powerless decision. It is a resignation, but it is not a powerless decision. It is a gift. To commend something is to give it. And in these last moments before his very real death, Jesus offers God a gift, makes the decision to offer that gift. You don't have to be on a cross to make that decision. Christians do it every day. 
decide to give our lives to the work of God. Not in moments of death alone, but in moments of life again and again each day. We're not all called to go into ordained ministry with the robe and the stole, but that's not what I mean. As Christians, we are all called to something. We're called to serve God. We're called to worship, called to follow, called to love God and love neighbor from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish until we are parted by death. And even then, even then, give it a couple of days and we'll see. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit.